But you can rest assured I will not take more than one lap around this building. <laughs> Amen. God bless him. Okay. Verse 5. God thundereth marvelously with his voice. Great things doth he which we cannot comprehend. For he saith to the snow, Be thou on the earth. Likewise to the small rain and to the great rain of his strength. He sealeth up the hand of every man that all men may know his work. Then the beasts go into dens and remain in their places out of the south cometh whirlwind and cold out of the north. By the breath of God, frost is given, and the breath of waters is straightened. That means it got frozen. Also by watering, he weareth the thick cloud. He scattereth his bright cloud, and it is turned round about by his counsels, that they may do whatsoever he commandeth them upon the face of the world in the earth. He causes, now watch, I'm, I'm they're giving you a picture of storm, storms. All my life I, I, that I've been privileged to be a preacher, I've preached different things about storms, troubles, problems, perplexities, but I never have done this before. This, this was something I felt God showed to me. He showed it to me. Right here in Job's next verse, he explains the reason for storms. Storms will fall into three categories only. Three. Now, now just watch this. He causeth it, he's talking about the storm, the rain, the wind, the fiery things, the frost, the snow, whatever. Storms. He said, watch. He causeth it to come, whether for correction or for his land, or for mercy. Wow. That's good. Okay, now I'm going to read Psalms 104. Psalms 104, I think it is in verse 3. Yeah, here it is. Who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters. Now watch. Who maketh the clouds his chariot who walketh upon the wings of the wind. Okay, now I, I, I want to talk to you, Bible study, okay? I, I'm, I'm not taking a lap. Okay, I want to talk to you. I want to talk to you about discerning the storm and reacting properly. Because unless you discern the why of the storm, you and I can respond incorrectly. Lord, bless the teaching in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Those of you who have a baptized brain and would like some secular knowledge, storm, atmospheric disturbance, the colliding of air currents that release energy that cannot be controlled, causing violence to erupt and become manifested as lightning, thunder, snow, hail, rain, tornado, hurricane, cyclone, or wind. Another one, it says, two storm, the dictionary says. A strong attack against a fortified place, a person, a belief, or a behavior. Storms are viewed as damaging and destructive and hurtful causing loss. So, we have invented storm windows, storm cellars. We had them all the time because we had tornadoes in Kansas when I was in the Air Force and people went down in the storm. I remember one time went down in the storm and when they came up, the house was gone. Well, now it wasn't there. It was just gone. I was in Kansas with uh, Brother Merrill Cornwell like three days after it had a major tornado and he took me for a ride and Three times as wide as this building, there were cornfields and stuff, and it was like it, it was like a bulldozer or a John Deere tractor just went through that whole area. Trees, crops, houses, roads, everything. It was just evaporated. It was completely gone. 
And on that side and on that side of that alleyway, everything was fine. Wow. Storms are very disruptive. They are very costly. They're very, very, very destructive. Uh, are you hearing me? Yeah. I, I, I don't think you're getting it yet. I don't think you're getting it yet. Have you ever looked at the storm as having a ministry? You see, most of us are like David. When, when I, I wrote the scripture out, I think it's in, da, it's in Psalms 55, something like that. I can't hardly see my notes tonight. I'm so sorry. And, and he turned around and he said, if I could get the wings of a dove, he said, I would fly away from the stormy winds. And I wrote in my notes here somewhere, there's, there's somewhere saying, how like David we all are. When storms and troubles and crisis and perplexity come our way, I think for the most part, most of us will say, escape! Very few people, except for those who are extremely spiritual, will say, let's stay and experience it. And so why our natural response always is escape. God's desire for our storm is no, experience it. Because our desire is, ooh, get I feel good. Our, I, I'm not, I'm not running anywhere. I'm right here. God's desire in a storm is for us to experience discovery. Our desire in a storm is to experience deliverance. Get me out of here. I, I don't want the wind. I don't want the, the problems. I don't want any damage. But when God gives us a storm, it's instructive. It's not destructive. Man, I'm talking good. I'm talking good already. Woo! <laughs> you see, the one thing about a storm, when you have experienced a storm and have endured the storm and learned the lesson of the storm, the immediate response is always praise. He brought me out. He brought me through. He kept me safe. That's, that's a normal response. Praise. But, 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 when you have a God-oriented storm, it's not always praise. It's always growth. Discovery, maturity, transformation, change, alteration, confession, transparency, hunger, honesty. And I don't know about you, but it is with me. When I go through an episode, a crisis, a storm that has God sent... When I get through that thing, there's usually a lot, of, a lot of joy coming out of me. Because one of the things that you learn in a God storm is self-discovery. I thought I was stronger than this. I thought I was better than this. I didn't think anything coming my way could have shaken my faith. And sometimes when you go through a God-sent storm, you'll come out with a cry of not so much praise as, Lord, help me. Hold on to me. Change me. Cause me to see things in a better light than I've seen before. So it's not so much that a God storm takes away from us as it brings to us revelation and discovery. And, and for that, I would show you two portions of Scripture here in Job 38, I think Job 40 or 41, it says, And the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Boy, that 
what? That's, I'm, I'm ready to preach on that. You may be in a bunch of hell and trouble, but there's an answer in your whirlwind. There's an answer in your darkness. There's an answer coming to you from your despair and your discouragement because God loves you too much to let you go into a storm and try to handle it by yourself. Strikes me amazing. Job's got 42 chapters and all the questions and all the crying out and all the disappointment, discouragement that, that Job recorded in that book, God never answered it one time. The finish he got, as soon as he got finished with all his crisis and his reason and his griping and his damning, condemning the day he was born and all that, when it all finally stopped, now out of the storm center, out of the whirlwind, God said, it's time for me to take the pulpit. And, and one of the first things he says to Job, he doesn't congratulate him for being a, a perfect man, one that hates evil and eschews evil and loves righteousness. He turns around, who is this? I'm paraphrasing. Who is this that's talking nonsense? Who is this schmo that's taking stupid to a new level? Read, read. Start, start with Job 38 and go to Job 42 and then have a good night's rest. Say, oh, I, I just want so much for God to talk to me. Really? Really? And he's crying and griping about this and griping about that. And I wish this hadn't happened, that hadn't happened. And I know the guy's been beat up worse than I've ever beat up in my life. But you understand that th 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 there's different types of storms. I'm in a Bible study here. Just, just, just stay with me just for a second. We must determine the type of storm we are in or we will come up with the wrong response. One storm is what I call the storm of disobedience. When you know to do right and you don't do it and God lets a storm break. Point in case. Abraham going down to Egypt and becoming a liar. Samson messing around with a wrong girl and getting a crew cut. And now he's in a storm of disobedience. Because his disobedience has put him in the dungeon. You gotta hear me. Just, just stay with me just a minute. Disobedience storm, where we do things that we shouldn't do. We love the story of the prodigal, but the prodigal is the product of a storm of disobedience. I don't want to do what my dad says. I don't like the rules on the farm. Okay, fine. God will allow a disobedience storm to come into our lives, and while we're going through a disobedience storm. God will help us to see the error of our ways and help us to repent and turn around and come back to Him. Because even in a disobedient storm, God's got His hand on it. Because He does not intend for our personal disobedience to have enough authority and power to destroy us, but rather that we can discover while we are in that storm where we made the wrong decision. Now, there's sometimes you haven't done anything wrong and you're put in a storm. That's not a disobedience storm. Just, just stay with me just for a second. I know what I'm told. I wrote the notes. I know. Disobedience storm. So you've got to ask yourself before you leave tonight, the storm that I'm in now, is it because of my disobedience? Now you've got another storm. There's only three kinds of storm. Personal disobedience. The next one is satanic. What I call devil storms. The thief comes to steal, to kill, to destroy. A devil storm, a Satan storm, it wants to seduce you. It wants to steal from you your joy. It wants to cripple and paralyze your faith. It wants you to lose your direction so that you don't have any confidence. 
His, his design in a Satan devil storm is your destruction. Watch. When God sends you a storm, his design is development. And development comes through discovery of myself, of my adversary, and of my God. In other words, when you and I go through a God storm, we're in school. And, and, and the Lord's our teacher. When you go through a devil storm, he's our destroyer. And he ain't teaching nothing. He wants to damn. He wants to condemn. He wants to ridicule. You know, isn't it funny how the adversary will talk us into doing stupid stuff, and then when we do it, he con condemns us for it? He tempts us and, and, and sidetracks us and gets us to do something stupid. And then when we do it, he goes, how in the world could you be a child of God doing something like that? That's when you need to yell. You just need to yell at him and say, yeah, I did something stupid. But guess what? I'm still a child of God. You ain't the choir director no more. You ain't the anointed cherub no more. You ain't going where I'm going. You get discouraged sometimes when that lion dog starts beating you up with words and emotions and feelings. You need to just put your foot down and say, wait a minute, stupid. Now, I've told you this at least 50 times. You need to remember what I'm telling you. Lucifer sinned and failed God when there wasn't a devil. So when that dirtbag comes up to you and I and we, we've done something stupid and he starts damning and condemning and say, wait a minute. I had an advantage taken over me. I had to deal with the devil. You didn't have to deal with anybody. You were so dumb, you could mess it up by yourself. Now that's not an excuse for us to do stupid stuff, but it is to understand. Don't let him talk trash to you. Don't let him damn you and condemn you and ridicule and rub your nose in your mistake. Don't let him do that. He is the biggest mistake in the universe. God thinks so much of his mistake, he made him his own place to live forever. All mistakes and stupid people go here. Satanic, devil-inspired storms to destroy you to defeat you, to demean you, to grade you, to make you feel like you have no value and you have no worth. You got to stop that argument and say, wait a minute. When I was a sinner, he died for me. When I was lost and undone, he died for me. When I was messed up and hopeless, he died for me. I must have some kind of worth now. I want to help you, baby. When God puts his stamp on your soul, ain't no devil got an eraser that can take it off. That's that old story about, does your master pay tax? Remember that story? He turned around and said, does he pay tax? He said, well, uh, let, let me see the coin. I used to preach years ago when I was young and crazy. I used to preach a great message on that. He said, uh, Boy, Jesus couldn't make it in our group because he had to ask for a penny. He said, show me a penny. You ain't got a penny? You ain't got a penny? You ain't got a track money in your pocket? No, you ain't got nothing? No. Show me a penny. So somebody reached in and showed him a penny. What? I always love what he said. Whose image and superscription is this? In other words, whose picture and whose name is on the coin. He said, Caesar's. He said, well, then give Caesar what belongs to him and give God what belongs to him. So when you repent of your sins, get water baptized in Jesus' name, the name of Jesus is stamped on you. You become his property. And when you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, he begins transforming us and conforming us into the image of Jesus Christ. That's why you shouldn't get discouraged when sometimes the image gets a little hidden. Wow. Has anybody ever had, I, I, 
I like looking at coins. I mean, they don't stay with me much, but I like looking at them. And I always like looking at these old, old nickel, nickels, those buffalo, buffalo. I, I used to have some uh, Indian head nickels. And sometimes the only thing left on the Indian head was a feather and a part of a nose. Guess what? It was still worth a nickel. I got news for you, baby. Some of that image might have got messed up in your life, but you're still worth everything he was willing to die for. hear me friend satanic storms want to wash away and wear away his image and his name that is on you but God will only let it get washed away so far I've had, I've had nickels and pennies that were almost completely raw there wasn't hardly anything on it and I could give it in in those days when I lived on candy bars you could buy a huge candy bar for a nickel or two pretzels in New York for a nickel. And you'd give it this thing, and, and the date was wore off it, and the Indian feathers were off it, or George Washington's face was gone, and all you had left was his little wig. And when you flipped it to him, it was still worth a nickel. Don't let no lying devil turn around, because he can flip you around and flip you around, that you don't have value to God. If God has put his spirit in you, if God has put his name on you, if God has allowed his holy blood to wash you, you got value. I'm almost there. I think I'm going in the right direction. I hope I am. Amen. So, so how many times have I told this church, and I need to repeat it again tonight, that means... When you get into your storm, your outcome be mainly de 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 uh, decided by your outlook. You can't come out looking good and thinking yourself lousy. You can't do that. You can't have a positive out outcome and have a negative outlook. It just doesn't work that way. So what I'm trying to tell you tonight is for your own homework, you got to discover right now. Or what you've just been, what kind of storm have I been in? Have I been in a personal disobedience? I've been there. Not most of you, you're spiritual, you're so dynamic. I mean, God almost asks you for advice. Yeah, right, that's good. But, but, but the rest of us, we struggle. And, and, and sometimes I've, I've, I've made decisions, and my decisions have defeated me. And... Uh, and I, I, well, I had one Sunday, <laughs> yes, uh, and, uh, and, and fine, you know, it's okay, fine, I, I, I became disobedient, I, I, I knew I shouldn't have done that, I shouldn't have watched that, shouldn't have read that, shouldn't have gone there, but you know, sometimes when you make a decision that's borderline, if you're not careful, the thing that will help you go over the border is when you look how other people live, well, they get by. Well, well, those guys are wacko. They, 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 they're almost a whoremonger. Just, I don't see any reason for doing this. And the minute you go over the line, all those justification things disappear. Whoosh. That's because satanic storms come from the master of deception. And he is a deceiver. That prodigal had all that trouble because of self-will. Because of, of, I want what I want. And sometimes when you and I get into a self-imposed disobedience storm, I hate to tell you this, I don't want to hurt your feelings, you probably stay longer than you want to. Because the Lord wants to make sure when he gets you out of there, you've learned your lesson. You know, one of the blessings of being retrieved, reprieved, reconciled by God is so that with the grace and the help of God, we won't do that again. 
Now, I used to say that when I was a drunk and a hell raiser and a honky tonk and throwing my guts up in a commode somewhere. You get me out of this, I ain't never coming back here. And as I got out till next Saturday. I, 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 will, I will never, God, if you get me out of this, I'll help you. I will never do this again until I'm tempted. But I've learned some lessons. Now, I haven't learned them all because I'm still in school, but I've learned some lessons about storms that are created by disobedience. There's people in this church right now, whether you want to admit it, a lot of them aren't even here tonight, so I can just preach to the doors or to you. They, they have financial junk going on in their life because they are disobedient about their giving and their finance. And, and, and God's not trying to cut anybody short in anything because he doesn't like anybody. And God doesn't do that because he's vindicative and he just wants to be punitive towards us because of our, uh-uh. He does that because he wants to get us on the right track. If God didn't want us to get corrected, you know what he'd do? He'd leave us alone. Say, go ahead, stupid. Keep doing that. Go ahead, stupid. Go ahead. Go ahead. Keep bashing your head against the wall. That's fine. There's people turn around and say, I never understand why I can't get ahead. I'm going to tell you what I know. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. And may I add without adding to the scripture, and not in 24 hours. We've been going this way and this way and this way, and we finally realize we're banging our head against the wall, and God helps us and says, you need to go that way. Well, when you go that way, if you're not careful, you'll think that 15 steps that way takes care of four years that way. And no, no, no work that way. You just stay with it. And in time, in time, you've got, you got to accept the fact that when you've corrected your direction and how you feel and what you do, that eventually, in God's time clock, he's going to turn this thing around for me. Listen, if, if this financial thing and this blessing thing turn people's lives around within the first 72 hours or three weeks, the mafia would be in the church. All the crooks would be in the church. All the politicians would be in the church if they can get God to work for them in 72 hours. Some of us have been in this thing a long time, and some things are just working now. That should have happened 20 years ago, but they didn't. But I'm here to tell you, and I'm not embarrassed, I'm here to tell you, living for God is the best thing you could ever do in your whole life. And God is a blessing God. God is a God of truth. God is a God of mercy. God is a God of forgiveness. God is a God of restoration. God is a God of deliverance. I wish I had somebody in this house that has received mercy that would just shout at me. to grace. I'm a debtor to mercy. I'm not here because I'm spiritual. I'm here because he's good. I'm going as fast as I can. Man. Going as fast as I can. <laughs> See, if we're not careful, if we're not careful, we can get into a situation, a storm, an episode of crisis and what will happen is, because we don't understand what kind of storm we're in or what caused it, the storm will of its own will manipulate us. Let me go a little further. The storm will maul you. Because one thing that a self-willed storm or satanic storm wants to do is reduce you to nothing. So that what you used to be so adamant about and believed to be right, you start second guessing yourself and say, well, maybe I should, well, maybe that's wrong. You got to watch out because the purpose of a satanic storm or a disobedient storm is our destruction and defeat. But the purpose of a God storm is our instruction, our revelation, our development, our enrichment. Now, it's hard for us to accept sometimes, God, how could God love me so much and put me in a storm? Oh, really? I'm glad you asked that. 
You did ask that, didn't you? No. Remember? Disobedience storm. Then you got a satanic storm. Those are rough, boy. Satanic storm. You know, uh, kill your faith, steal your joy, steal your song. You know, you know, satanic, satanic storm like Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to sift thee as wheat. A satanic storm to steal from you what God wants to do in your life. You see, satanic storms today are designed to kill you tomorrow. That's why Demas got washed away in, in, the, in the ebb tide out in the ocean of lostness because he ended up into a storm that was satanic because Satan gives you a storm that allures and draws you a picture and paints it better. I don't know how many times over the years I've been privileged to be a part of this assembly that I've been challenged and taught and talked to by people in all, in all different walks in this city about, you know, Arnold, uh, if, if you'd get off that restraint and restriction and you, and you had this get away from that modesty, morality thing, you could have the biggest church in the city. I've heard that for years. I said, look, the little handful I got now is driving me crazy. all you want to. I'd like to know how Moses passed the two and a half million people. Right. Read the Bible. You do read the Bible once in a while. Read the Bible. It says that the people would stand and he would go from morning to night judging the people. Till his father-in-law said, hey, look here. I'm paraphrasing. Look at here, Bo. You're fixing to wear yourself out with these people. These people are as spiritual as Egypt is. Remember, these people were slaves. They didn't have any better morals, most of them, than Egypt had. And they, God's brought them out of slavery to bring them into a new kingdom, a new concept, a new lifestyle. It's going to take a lot of unlearning and a lot of new learning. That's why you, if you're involved in the church work, you cannot let yourself get discouraged with the lack of results. I just said that to myself. Because I was reading about my sweet brother Elijah again. Man, what a message I want to preach on him. How to deal with being dejected. He poured his soul out to God in that Mount Horeb, in that cave. You know why he was there? Because he didn't have any success. He'd given himself to that silly bunch of Israelites who could care less about what was right or wrong. Poured his life out, fasted, prayed, put on a supernatural display, killed a bunch of false prophets, had a handful of people said, Yay, Jehovah! Yay, Jehovah! That lasted about three days. And that's why you read it, read it. Go to, go to 1 Kings 19 and read it when he's in, in Mount Horeb and talking to the Lord. He said, I, even I only am left. And, and ever, they've killed your prophets and Jezebel. Watch. It's so easy to get discouraged after God has mightily used you, put a great demonstration of the supernatural. Fire fell from heaven. They killed all the false prophets. And they ended a three-and-a-half-year drought with a 63-word prayer. And he outran a chariot 19.2 miles to the valley of Jezreel. Watch. This can bring dejection. And, Je Je and Jezebel said, big deal. She was unmoved by the miraculous. Ahab was still a milk toast, wussy fied wacko. He had a spine like a jellyfish. He never changed. Don't you get it? He, he never gave Elijah thank you for the end of the drought. When you pour yourself out, Whatever service you're doing in this assembly, and there isn't any results that you can take notice of, watch out. Man, I've given my best. I've poured myself out, man. I've drove myself crazy. I've bankrupt myself. I've lived on peanuts. 
I made my living for 30 some odd years, not from this church. I made it from all over the world where I preached everywhere. I take nothing from you. How do you think you paid all your bills? How do you think you sent all these missionaries? How do you think you fed Tupelo Children's Mansion? Wasn't your giving, baby. It was your faithfulness in your tithing. I gave it all away. If I hadn't gone out, I'd be broke. And every once in a while, when I start adding up what you got and what I ain't got, if I'm not careful, the wrong wind will blow against me. Look how you've sacrificed. Look what you've done. You still drive used cars. They drive new cars. You still live in the same house 33 years. They got new houses. What are you wasting your time here? Yeah, I got the same group of people. Nobody, nobody new comes in. Nobody. What's going on? Can't get people to teach Bible studies. Can't get people to visit anybody. What's going on? That's when you got to take your little knapsack and go to Mount Horeb and listen to the Lord and say, well, "What doest thou here, Elijah?" You know, what I love about that meeting, Bob. You know, what I love about that. Now he has left Israel. At a key moment, he could have helped revival turn around, but, but he left, got filled with despair, got filled with fear. That encourages me, even though I feel bad for my man, Elijah, it encourages me that a man as great as that could let some old bag scare him. I've always got to, I've preached that for 30 years. Jezebel said, the gods do to me and more that if I don't make your life as one of them that you just did today, I've got it in my Bible. You can come read it. Pretty safe, lady. All your gods didn't work. You called on your gods at Mount Carmel. None of them answered. None of them brought fire. You're pretty safe saying, let the gods do to me what you've done to my preachers. Your gods don't exist. Read, read it. Just, just read it. Just read 1 Kings 18, 1 Kings 19. There's a wonderful statement in that thing. It says, and when Elijah saw that, read it. Put a circle around it. Say, Arnie preached on this when he saw that. Saw what? An old loudmouth bag who was an idolatrous woman who was the son of Eth Baal, the king of the Zidonians, false lady, a false prophetess, a, a, a nasty living witch, when he saw what? No army, no soldiers, no chariots, no bazookas, no scud missiles, no Uzis. What did he see? Pictures. Because words produce pictures. And pictures produce feelings. And feelings produce actions. And actions produce destinies. I know you think I'm just some old stupid stroke victim. Listen to me. I am as serious as a heart attack. You need to be real careful who sits next to you. You need to be careful who talks into your life because they can create pictures of fear and anxiety and doubt. There are no pictureless words. You understand how powerful words are? You say, well, deeds are powerful. No, words. How about when they walk up to you and say, it's cancer. It's inoperable. It's a tumor. It's too deep. We can't operate. Tell me what that word does for you with a picture. How about, how about these words? I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll never put on you more than you can bear. With every test and every trial, I'll make a way of escape for you. Greater is he woo, that is in you than he that is in the world. And if God be for me and for thee, who or what can be against us? What do those words create? 
pictures of victory, pictures of a conqueror, pictures of an overcomer. Satanic storms. How about 40 chapters of Job? Remember, it was Satan who brought the storm. Now, I've read a lot of literature over the years, and, and, and I just beg to differ. I'm trying to be nicer than I usually am. I beg to differ with a lot of these commentators. I think they're full of hot air. When they turn around and said, God did that. God didn't do nothing. God took his hand off the situation and let Satan get involved. It was Satan who stole his children. It was Satan who killed that, ruined that home. It was Satan who had all those animals stolen. It was Satan who had all the servants slain. It was Satan who was allowed to strike him with boils. Wait a minute. There's some things that are not written that are implied. You need to understand, when you are in a satanic storm, not only will you deal with things emotionally and physically and financially, you will deal with depression and despair and discouragement. Wait a minute. When you get into a satanic storm, that voice, that spirit will tell you the reason why all this hell's breaking loose in your life is because you failed. You didn't teach them. You didn't teach her. You didn't teach him. You didn't raise your kids right. You didn't run your business right. That guy's a liar. Because he's trying to jab you with arrows and spears and make you bleed to death or self-destruct. Sometimes some of the, the greatest and biggest battles that I've ever fought is not with devils and diseases and pain or my silly eyesight or, or people that attack me and ins, insult me and do all that kind of foolishness. That's, that's not the issue. It's stuff that gets in my brain. It's stuff that gets in my emotions. It works on me over and over. If that was just a fleeting thought and said, well, this happened because you did this, fine. But it just... It just challenges me. It just churns on me. It just. And you got to make sure you choose the right response. So you. So I asked the Lord these last couple of days praying. I said, Lord, help me to respond correctly and not incorrectly. I know that I've been granted by these wonderful people and your kindness authority in this particular building and this assembly. I have pastoral authority. But it's very easy to misuse and abuse pastoral authority when I get mad about something. I'm going to let that simmer for 60 seconds. You just think what I just said. How easy it is when I get assaulted and insulted by people. For me to just turn around and throw my head back and say, who do you think you're talking to? Are you out of your mind, Cora? Have you lost your mind, Dathan and Abiram? Do you know who you're coming against with your pitiful little plan? And then I just get ready to really load you good. Because I got both guns. I'm like Yosemite Sam. I'm ready. You want to rumble? Let's rumble. And just as I get ready to put both my feet in my mouth and tell you how the cow ate the cabbage, the Lord flashes a picture in front of me and says, Remember your example of Moses. Why? Remember how Moses responded to the idiots that challenged him because they didn't like what he was doing. The Bible said he fell on his face. I want to fall on your face and straighten your face out. But 
I'm wrong for thinking that. And I'm wrong for feeling that. Because that's why the Bible said, Moses was of most men on the earth, most meek. And when they started their chanting and started beating him up, that stupid Korah turns around and says, you take too much on yourself. You better be careful when you attack your leadership. You better be really, really careful. Because what will happen is the Lord will back up the leadership and he'll deal with you. Moses fell on his face and turned around and he said, What's the matter with you people? Don't act like this. Don't be crazy. What are you, what are you doing this? And before he could even get another sentence out, the Bible said the cloud came down. The Lord said, get away from them. You think I'm going to put up with a bunch of rednecks that's going to attack my leadership because they're upset about a point? Get away from him. I'll deal with Dathan and Korah and Abiram. And we'll see who has the last laugh. That earth opened up and swallowed him and his whole family and his kids. That means, watch, he lost himself, his wife, and his future. And that thing came back together and fire went out from the Lord and burned up 250 of the hot dogs. And when they all got turned into French fries, then God's cloud come and said, Next! You may think you have a right to voice your opinion, stupid. But you better not do it in a mob position. Be very, be very careful when anybody in any position in this church and you disagree with them over something, be very careful not to take a mob of your gangsters with you and attack them. You got Bible on how to deal with that one on one, two or three, then the whole church. Don't, 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 don't go after the Sunday school director or go after Carrie or Elaine or go after Brother Hino or go after anybody, the video, audio, don't, don't do that. Cause, cause that, I'm telling you, to me, when that happens, that flashes in God's face and said, ho ho, we got another Cora deal on our hands. I can take care of this. And don't misread into what I just said. That's a satanic storm. Because one of the, the issues of a satanic storm is this, division. I just told a guy today when he was talking to me, he said, I can't believe what's happened to, excuse me, the Republican Party. It's totally disintegrated. What in the world's happened to him? I said, I looked at him, I said, well, that's real easy. The Bible told us that. He goes, every time you talk, it's the Bible. I said, well, if you idiots would listen to me in the Bible, you wouldn't have all this hell going on right now. I said, I'll tell you exactly what's happened to the Republican Party. A house divided against itself can't stand. And with all their foolishness they're doing, they're, gonna, they're fixing to give this election to Hillary if they don't stop. Now, forget my political views. I'm, I'm giving you a biblical principle. A house divided can't stand. If I end up attacking somebody in this church who's in a leadership position, and I don't do it in a God-fearing, in a humble, the right way, I have just introduced a satanic spirit of division that can hurt the whole body. Even, even if I am wrong, in, I mean right, in my premise. You know, you can be right in something and handle it wrong. I got to step back up. My chest is pounding right now. My whole chest is on fire right now. I'm going to run down. Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Now, if Patty was here right now, she'd say, breathe.
So, you, you know, you're going to have one or two things. Your storm is going to allow you to experience deliverance or allow you to experience discovery. Better, better than being taken out of or even going through. It's much better for your storm to take you to. The satanic storm that was introduced to Job's life, as I said, was to steal his children, which was his joy, which was his happiness. Any parent feels that way. To steal his stuff so he couldn't provide for his offspring. To, to wreck him financially, emotionally. And what he was trying to do was finally get him. See, the last step he can get to is spiritually. And that's why he always has to go through your stuff or your family or your loved ones because see that's the only areas he can get to he is not allowed access to your spirit don't ever believe that he cannot he can deal with your physical plant and he can deal with your soul but your spirit belongs with God it is that separate sanctuary that only he has access to and so if, if you and I are tied to our soulless realm and our physical realm they can have access to our spirit realm. So if he can get our feelings hurt or get disappointed or get angry about something or whatever, that satanic thing is working. And you'd be surprised. I, I've had something just bump into me like that. And my goodness, that, that dumb thing would stay alive for two weeks. I find myself, I don't know about you, you're probably all dynamically spiritual. It's so nice for you just to descend into this service tonight for an hour. I hope you get back home okay. But it's like, that thing just keeps visiting me. I've been hit by something. I've been hurt by something. I've been disappointed by something. Laugh all you want to, but I haven't had a good night's sleep since Saturday. Because I relived these services for three days. And I tried to retrace everything good that was said and everything crazy. And I tried to figure out what happened and what took place. And, and it's just like toss and turn, toss and turn, toss and turn. I just sit up in bed and say, okay, that's enough now. i got to get some sleep. <laughs> Sister Arnold comes walking. Cause I sleep in the spare bedroom now because I... I'm up and down night and day ever since I've had a stroke. I, I, I drive her crazy getting up and down, so I sleep in the spare bedroom. And she comes coming down the hall. Jeffrey, Jeffrey, what? Are you okay? I'm sitting up in bed. I said, of course I'm okay. Well, I heard you yelling. I was talking to the devil. <laughs> she thought I was having another stroke or a heart attack. I'm... Now, see, it doesn't happen to you because you're so dynamically spiritual. You just rise above it. You know something? Man, I ought to preach a sermon sometime to this church. I talk back to the devil. I really do. I just put up with that trash so far, and I got to get a good night's rest. This got, you got to get out of my head. Because I'm an emotional person. And things that happen sometimes, I take it so personally. It's like somebody spit in my face. Somebody kicked me in the leg. Somebody called me a fool, an idiot, a thief, a robber. It just, it just agitates me because I'm so adamant about being moral and about being honest and trying to be a God-fearing man. When I'm assaulted and insulted and stuff like that, it just... It, it so affects me, I go into a rage. A good name is better than precious ointment. Better be desired than gold or silver or wealth or rubies or jewels. You turn around spit in my face because you're upset about something? And I got to turn around and say, remember Moses. Remember Moses. Remember Moses. And I say, yeah, I remember Moses. He didn't get into the promised land. I remember Moses. clear the air right now. I ain't got no problems with nobody. 
I'm trying to teach a concept, a principle, a precept. That's all I'm trying to do. I wish I had at least 20 people in this place could be honest enough to turn around and say, give me an amen in a second and say, yeah, I deal with that sometimes too. Guess what? We're just people. We're just people. Okay, it's quarter till. I got 10 minutes, okay? I mean, the other guy was an hour and 35 minutes. Give me 10 minutes. Okay? Where's Sharon? Sharon, was that a great statement I made that night? I said, what did you find on the cell phone? He was talking to his, looking at his wife, and I said, why don't you give him a million dollars worth of thoughts with a spoonful of words? <laughs> I should have saved that for the general conference. <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm, I'm almost done, honest. So you understand? We got these two kinds of storms, the one that's self-induced because of disobedience. And only you, only you, not even me. Don't ever think because I'm a preacher that I can just snoop in your personal private business. That's crazy. Unless God gives me a word of knowledge, you better hope he gives me a word of wisdom. Because wisdom is profitable for direction. So I don't need to know your personal issues and your situations. Only you can make the decision. Only you, after you leave this service, can turn around and say, have I been going through a storm or did I go through something that was induced by disobedience? If you can honestly, sincerely answer and say, no, fine, then you're free from that. Don't let that bum paint any more pictures in your head. Don't let him pull any more strings in your heart or your mind. Forget it. Forget it. Now, this other one, satanic storms that they introduce. You can pick up on them real easy. They'll eventually deny the principles of the Word of God. They'll eventually run you down. Remember, as guilty as you and I have ever been, God has never one time come to us with condemnation. He will not bring condemnation. He will bring conviction, but He won't bring condemnation. So if you're sensing any kind of intrusion into your life or something, that's a condemnation. That's coming in sat satanic Want you to quit, want you to insurrect, want you to cause a division, want you to... No, watch it. It's satanic. It's satanic. It's deceptive. You got to pray against it. You got to take authority over it. You got to plead the blood of Jesus over it. You are allowed as a child of God to bind that spirit and bind that voice. You can tell that thing not to be allowed to keep tormenting you. Hopefully you'll do better than me and you won't wake up at four in the morning. Could just do your little prayer Jesus name and it'll all be gone I got I got one more thing I need to say <laughs> then you have a God storm contrary to what we've been taught or we've heard on the radio or watched on TV a God storm isn't always nice but it's filled pregnant with divine purpose and plan because God can even make the wrath of man praise him God storm point in case Joseph hated by his own brethren thrown into a pit by his own family sold into slavery Lied on by Mrs. Potiphar, put in jail for a long time. And then when the, when, when, when the God storm comes to a conclusion, promotion. But the promotion is waiting on how you and I respond to the storm. That's why Joseph later on when he talked to his brethren, he said, You meant it for evil. But God meant it for good. Well, how could my suffering, how could my messed up stuff, how could God mean that for good? Because he's going to use the negative to create the positive. Because he's going to show you that there's some of his people 
that Satan's going to get his mouth shut and said, there's some of my people can go through trouble and negative things and have a good spirit. Watch. Not satanic, a God storm. The three Hebrews. It looks like Nebuchadnezzar, satanic. Oh, no. He's just a tool. He's just a pawn. God is set up the storm because he's going to use three guys' conviction to change a whole nation. According to the Bible, those three guys were three presidents in their government. But they didn't have the clout to affect a whole nation. They were just over a province. So God says, I got a plan. I'm going to bring a God storm to these guys. I'm going to use El Stupido because he thinks he's in charge of everything. And I'm going to put him in the fiery furnace. Watch this. When they come out of the furnace, the whole kingdom is going to be affected for Jehovah. So some, woo, I feel like talking. Sometimes a God storm will throw you in a pit. A God storm will put you in a prison. A God storm will put you in a furnace. A God storm will throw you in a lion's den. But if you keep your spirit right and keep your attitude right, you're coming out of it. And when you come out of it, God's going to get glorified. God's going to get honored. And you're going to get blessed and promoted. Okay, it's five till, ten till. Okay, I'm almost done. You got it? <laughs> God's storm. <laughs> you understand? A God storm is literally a platform from the potentate for his people. It's kind of what that, I preached you at one Sunday years ago. It didn't go over very well, but I'm going to try to preach it again sometime when you're feeling better. When, when James writes and says, we've seen the, the patience of Job, and we've seen the long suffering and the suffering of the prophets. Watch. And we know also the end of the Lord. I preached that to you one Sunday morning. It went over like a lead balloon. You've got to understand something. When he says that we have seen the end of the Lord, what does the end of the Lord mean? Here's what it is. The end of the Lord. What God had in mind when he let the storm come. You missed, you missed it again. What was his purpose and his plan when he let that stuff break loose in your life? It wasn't your destruction. It was your instruction. It was your transformation. It was your maturity. It was your growth in God. It was your conformity to the image of Jesus. That's what the end of the Lord was. When he got ready to let all that junk happen with Job, with Joseph, with the three Hebrews and Daniel, the end is what he had in his mind. This, this is where I'm taking them. This is the route I'm using. You see, the, the end of the Lord in the story of Job, although he was a perfect man and eschewed evil and loved God and walked in righteousness, there were still areas in his life that God wanted to improve on. So what did he do? He used all this loss, sorrow, sickness, pain, disaster, despair, discouragement, defeatism to get him to chapter 40, 41, and 42 where Job, for the first time in his life, said, I abhor myself. And I repent in sackcloth and ashes. Watch. For I have spoken of things that I knew not of. I am not as righteous and godly as I thought I was. How many times have I told this sweet church, listen, baby, don't get too high on your horse. God can ask you some questions that will give you a question mark for a brain. You read chapter 40, 41, and 42. He asked Job so many questions. Job was like a slobbering idiot. I love, I love, I love, I love. You know how eagles fly? I love, you know how the heat goats spring down? You know how the hawk flies? Do you, you know how I move all the constellations over? Could you tell me because you're very old and you know how to do that? I love, 
I'm telling you, baby, you get God in a mood, he can ask you some stuff that will give you an excedrin headache. Does the hawk fly by your wisdom? Uh, uh, well, uh, 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 ha, ha. I had some more on this scripture I wanted to show. Yeah, I got it right here. Here it is. I got it right here. Uh, yeah, here it is. In the same chapter that I read from Job 37, if you go down just a little bit, watch what he says. In verse 16, dost thou know, here it is, the balancing of the clouds. Never heard anybody preach on that in my life. Never read it in the book. Never stole it off a tape ministry anywhere. That thing has been blowing my brain for 25 years. Does thou know the balancing of the clouds? What do you mean? Are you able to deal with the dark as well as the bright? Can you function as well with God in the rain as you can in the sunshine? Are you the one in charge of the balancing of the clouds? Or am I in charge of the balancing of the clouds? The balancing. He didn't say, does thou know the different clouds? He said, no, no. Does thou know the balancing of the clouds? Are you great enough? Woo! God. Are you great enough? Are you smart enough? Are you wise enough to be able to balance things out in everybody's life? You're going to damn and condemn me because you're having a bad day. I'm in charge of the balancing of the clouds. I know how much rain to bring in your life. I know how much sunshine you need. I know just when you need a great sunrise and when you need a peaceful sunset. I'm the one in charge of the balancing of the cloud. Oh I'm sorry, Rev. I'm just, I'm out there. I'm sorry. I'm just out there. Wow. <laughs> Let me try it again. Don't you know that these storms come? For correction, or for his land, or for mercy. That's the only three reasons that God sends a storm. So you've got to find out what kind of storm you're in. A disobedient storm, a satanic storm, or a God storm. And then you've got to find out if you're in a God storm, what is God trying to do? Is he trying to bless me, my property, my children, my life? That's what he needs for the land. Or is he trying to show mercy? Or is he trying to correct you about something? Boy, you got to have some homework. You go home tonight. I'm almost finished, Rev. Uh, uh, didn't I give you a scripture, Psalms 148? Did I give that to you? Or did, what did I give to you? Nahum? Huh? Nahum? Chapter 1, verse 3. Just let him read the scripture, and, I, and we'll call it quits, okay? I'm not done, but I've done a good job. The Lord is slow to anger. Hold it. I'm taking a lap. That's a 71 year old lap. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. Watch this. His good way to end this. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. And will not at all acquit the wicked. Watch this. Here, here's the one I wanted. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and, and in the storm. Ha! Wait a minute. Don't you ever believe that if God lets you get into a storm, that hell's going to have its way, that your enemies are going to have its way, or the devil's going to have his way. No, 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 no. I don't care how bad the wind's blowing. I don't care how dark it may seem. The Lord will have his way in the whirlwind, and the Lord will have his way in the storm, because he's the Lord of everything. You remain standing. I, I, I'm not finished. I'm just going to stop. But you got to get this last part. And, and what did he say? And the, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. Oh, Brother Storm, you hear me, baby? You hear me right now? Watch what he said. You're in a dark spot. The wind's blowing. Your rockleton's coming. You're in a cyclone. You're in a disaster of upheavals of feelings, emotions, and stuff. And, you, and, and the clouds are so there, you can't see nothing. Just remember this. The clouds are the dust of his feet. That is exactly why Elijah told Ahab, take over your chariot, 
lest the rain hinder thee from getting to Jezreel. Why? Because he had the servants just tread away, look out and said, you see, they said, yeah, I see the cloud the size of a man's hand. Elijah said, that's the dust of his feet. He's on his way. So even if you have just a little bit of dust in the spirit, you got an answer on its way because he's the Lord of the whirlwind and he's the Lord of the storm. God bless everybody and give them a good night's rest. Take care of them and let them sleep good and help them have great thoughts about me. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You may, be, may go home.